You're listening to Trek FM. Want to join in the conversation and share your thoughts on this episode? Join the Babel Conference, our listeners' discussion group on Facebook. Just type B-A-B-E-L into the Facebook search field, and we look forward to seeing you there. This is Steve Sansweet of Rancho Obi-Wan, and you're listening to the 602 Club. There was a little bar in Mill Valley where all the Starfleet trainees used to go. The 602 Club. You know it. <laughs> I was there more times than I can remember. Kurt, how often you think about it? You know, shit we did over there. All the time. But my conscience is clear. Afghanistan. It's different. You know? Different how? It's just different. Things we did. The, Kind of got blurred. What were you into, Frank? You see, what worries me the most is that you've been in a hole so long that it's become home. Maybe that's where I'm supposed to be. Do me a favor, Frank. Don't be a wallowing asshole. Before I have to take this fake leg off and beat you to death with it. Imagine your tombstone. Frank Castle lose an ass kicking contest to a one legged man. I'd do it. Yeah, actually, kind of like to see that. Take care of yourself, Kurt. Welcome to the 602 Club, Track FM's General Geek Show. I am your host, Matthew Rushing, and I'm really excited to be here tonight. We've got a great show for you. We're going to be talking about something I was really excited to get to, and I'm very glad that I gave it the time. Uh, to, to be able to watch through and really enjoy and kind of savor. Uh, and uh, I've got one of the greats from podcasting with me to talk about this. Uh, the one and only John Mills. So who's the great? I know. I showed up. Where is he? It's you. You're the great. Just, oh, please. You are podcasting uh, in America. Ah, uh, whatever. Um, <laughs> we are greatness together. That's what I know. And I'm really excited that uh, you're here to talk about the Punisher from Me Netflix yeah. uh, Marvel series. And um, I know for you, Don, even before we even do anything else, this is something, uh, this is a character that you really loved in comics. I did. I uh, I read the Punisher back in the, you know, the eighties and everything. I, I remember when they introduced him as a villain and uh, all of that type of stuff. He, and I always had an affinity for the Punisher and he's had a lot of evolution through the years where he like, and that's sort of the question always when when they adapt comic book properties is which version of the character are you going to be true to? Which version mm. are you trying to get to? And it's it you know so I was with bated breath. I I, I loved what they did with the Punisher in uh, Daredevil season two. Yeah, me too. I, that was my thought, favorite part of that season. Yeah, you know, hands down, hands down. And when they announced this, I was like, ooh, okay, okay, well, they could do this. They could pull this one off. So uh, before we get to anything else, then I'm interested. Uh, where do you, being a comic book lover of the Punisher, which uh, version do you feel like they pulled from the most? Wow, uh, you know, honestly, I think they pulled from his full history the most. Um, I think that they they pulled a little bit from when uh, Garth Ennis was writing him. I think they pulled a little bit from the original. Uh, his relationship with Micro is very. Different but familiar in this because micro microchip, it was shortened to micro um, microchip back when he was originally, uh, you know, a part of the team was a very different. He w- he was the computer nerd of that era, so they updated micro to be a computer nerd of this era. But the re- and the relationship they have is very, it's very familiar, but it's different because microchip was always. He always came across as a little bit older. He was sort of your, a more stereotypical take on a computer nerd, especially from back in the 80s, you know, overweight, thick glasses, Radio Shack, you know, nerd sort of thing. And so kind of so, like uh, Bob from uh, uh, Stranger Things too. Yes, that is, that's a great way to put it. That is a great way to put it. Now imagine Bob having somebody who he fed information to that went around and shot bad guys. There you go. That's perfect. All right. Exactly. Hmm. 
Well, yeah, that makes for an interesting show. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> I just can't picture that one, but no, that's really funny. Um, well, hey, uh, gosh, before we get into anything else, uh, just a reminder, you can find uh, us all over the place. Uh, follow us on Twitter at uh, Trek FM. Like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Trek FM. Uh, you can find us, of course, on uh, iTunes at itunes.com slash Trek FM. Um, Gosh, there are so many shows that we're doing here on the network, so make sure you're checking them all out. And while you're there, uh, you know, hit the star rating and review up uh, for the 602 Club. Help the show grow. Help more people find us. It, it uh, Seriously, it really does make a huge difference. And so, um, you know, I, I notice an incremental rise every time that somebody gives us a new star rating review. So just make sure you do that. Um, you can find us, uh, of course, online at trek.fm. You can get to the listeners-only discussion group, which is on Facebook, over the there. Uh, it's called the Babel Conference. Just go over to Facebook, type Babel in the search field, or if you're on you know, the, the website, you can hit any of the menu bars. You'll see a little button that says discussion, and that'll bring you over there. And last but not least, if you're wanting to, you know, get in a little bit deeper with the 602 Club and the hosts that we're on that week, you can uh, send us an email. Go to trek.fm slash contact, choose a show, choose the 602 Club, and we'll be able to respond to you. So, um, gosh, John, we uh, we we already got things kicked off, but um, we did. I, 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 and and the thing, but the thing is, now now that that we had that gear shift, I'm I'm sitting here this whole time. You know, you asked me about you know, like I got this long history with the Punisher and everything. Your history is is only Punisher from yeah, Daredevil, the, right? Uh, the only Punisher that that I've had in my life, um, because I haven't read a ton of Marvel comics. Um, I've read some uh, Ed Brubaker's uh, Captain America. Um, yeah, that's a good choice. Yeah, great. I, I really enjoyed his run. Um, and honestly, I just picked up the first Coates uh, Black Panther uh, Volume One. And ah, so, that's all. That's also a good run. Yeah, um, yeah it was Coach interesting. Does a good job um, with that title. So I'm, I, I haven't read part two, which it's very dependent on, on kind of where the story is going to go. I don't know how it plays out yet because I haven't read that yet. So slowly, kind of dipping in my my you know pinky, I guess, into the Marvel universe. But I've mainly been a DC guy. But you know, I I like a lot of the Marvel movies. And then you know when Netflix did Daredevil. First season just kind of blew me away. It was so good. Um, and then, you know, season two came out, and the first half of that season had to do with the Punisher. And that first half of that season was spectacular, and the Punisher was the best part of the show, like, hands down, yes. like we said. So, for me, you know, the fact that they were going to pick up the the whole micro, he got the CD uh, that had been given him, and... What's he? What's going to happen? I was very excited that they were going to do that, and that's kind of the setup for the show. Uh, and in fact, you know, this season kind of legitimately picks up with him using that information. Um, and what did you think of that? Uh, I thought that they did a really excellent job, and I think this speaks to the the season as a whole with the writing, where it tied in. Like this is a tie in show a tie-in property the way I like it done, where it's been a while since I've seen Daredevil Season 2, but I did see it, and so it ties in, and it it brings me back, and I'm like, oh, right, 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 okay, I'm with you, I'm with you. Whereas, I could sit somebody down who hasn't seen a single Marvel show before this, and it it serves as a perfect, you know, just build up into what you need with him, and it is, I, I just think, I think it was an excellent way to, you know, get you into uh, the mindset of the character. One of the things that I liked about it too, was that they kind of immediately hit you with Punisher being Punisher. You know, he's, he's in his, his costume and everything. He's taken people out. Um, The ways that he does that in this uh, are pretty spectacular, you know? Yes. Um, It kind of reminded me a little bit of uh, civil war with um, him on the motorcycle, you know, and, and killing, um, Iron Man's parents, except this time he's in the van and they're on the motorcycles, you know, and he takes them out and then he runs that dude over. Yeah. Uh, uh, Yeah. Yes. So Uh, it it felt a little bit like that, but in a different, like it it kind of like a muddy mirrored way, um, which I thought was kind of cool. I I agree. I I think that the fight choreography, um, what I like is, and you know, and I, I give the Marvel shows a lot of credit for this. 
uh, when you get to the movie scale, usually everybody, you know, it's some variation on the same sort of choreography enhanced by CG and everything like that. And what I've really liked that they've done is the fight choreography. When I look at Daredevil, when I look at Defenders, when I look at now Punisher, whoever they've got in charge of the fight choreography, whether they're coordinating it between the shows or whether it's just somebody who's, you know, a member of the creative family or something, the fight choreography speaks to the character. The type of fighting that Frank Castle yeah, does yeah. is not the type that Daredevil does. Daredevil has a totally different style than Frank Castle, and it is, I mean, look, I is there something broken inside of me or something? But, like, when I see something like this, this is joyous to me because it it doesn't do the wire foo matrix flippy thing going around and everything like that. It actually lends a great deal of realistic weight to the fight scenes. There are things that happen to people in this that one shot and you're done. But hey, but when they deliver those shots at the very least, it really adds the believability of everything overall. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. You know, this is the most grounded of grounded of all of their shows, I think, you know, because yeah. there isn't anything fantastical whatsoever happening. Um, you know, nobody is the world's most amazing fighter here in the sense of like a daredevil or, you know, oh gosh, let's not even get into Iron Fist. Um, but, you know, that kind of stuff. You're not getting any of that. You're just getting like blunt force trauma happening to people yes. with the blows and it and it makes you like you said it it feels like if somebody's getting punched or hit or whatever uh that there's damage being taken and you know there is a point like you said where you do have to uh suspend your disbelief especially by the end of the season um yes but i think that the setup here really does a great job of kind of it gets you back in the mode, but then, you know, that first episode kind of takes a different turn. Like, he's dropped it. He's not the Punisher anymore, and he's just dealing with everything that he's been through and the fact that he's still dealing with the loss of his family and the repercussions of that. You know, I like that they they set this up because what it is is this show actually... It, it's not as much about the Punisher. It really is a show about Frank Castle. Yes, I, I you're you're absolutely right. Um, I love the fact that the theme of of PTSD carries through, and the very first thing that they do is they throw at you. They double underline, circle, and bold the point that revenge doesn't chase the demons away. He does what he sets out to do. You know, yeah, I mean, to a, to a degree, that that you meet him on his mission in Daredevil season two, and he's still tortured. It doesn't make it go away, and it immediately. And I love this. It immediately goes right to the point that they keep coming back to in the show that it's not going to make the hurt stop. You can't stop the hurt by causing more hurt. And I think it's just such a beautiful way to turn it around. And with the brutality, that feels like the, you know, the Garth Ennis run of, of Punisher, that blunt force trauma stuff. But then they subvert it uh, by making it about how he can't he can't ever break that wall down completely. Like he's literally trying to break a wall down and there's always going to be a wall knocked out. I just I love that. I think it's brilliant. And I, I thought that that was one of the strongest things, you know, this this PTSD trip that he's on you know uh, it, and it, what's interesting is there are so many different characters throughout the series um here that are actually on that same trip but from different ways and they're all dealing with the same type of thing but they all deal with it differently but frank specifically he has nothing like he has nobody to talk to he has he has nobody there for him really he, and he has no way to deal with this um and so he kind of just, it is like he's beating his head against a wall, not a hammer, his head against the wall repeatedly just trying to make it stop. And what I thought was interesting is it. I liked the way that the season kind of gave him a, a little bit of redemption in that it, it became not just about him trying to do for him, but it became about him trying to do for Micro and his family. And keeping Karen safe and then caring about somebody like Madani, like all of these things come together, like Frank 
lets go of it being just about him and it turns his life around is is he is he ever going to be free totally of the demons no but i do feel like i felt and i felt like the end of this this show where when you end with frank i almost felt like you could never see the punisher again and you feel good about where the character might go next completely you know? agree completely agree and i and i think again you you've hit right on something where uh, they they take the time by him starting to care about micro by starting to care about Micro's family, by starting to care about Madani, you see that there's a baseline goodness about him because it's too easy to cheer for the anti-hero, and they go to great pains to show that the, like who he is as the Punisher is an externalization of the the anger and the hurt, but there's still that guy that wants to play ball with his son. And can't ever do it again. And the guy who wants to be the father figure. And the guy who wants to have the normal life. And I think that it's so fascinating the way they have him be like step in for Micro when Micro's family is missing him. And it gives Frank something that he wants but can't have. And Micro is also tortured because it's something he can have. But he has to deny himself, so it winds up being this this cool mirroring. And I like even to the point where, when you know, and we're going full spoiler with this, right? Oh we're yeah, presuming yeah, okay. definitely. When the kiss happens, mm-hmm. that was such a beautifully handled exchange of how much it hurt Micro that he knew his wife missed him that much. And he knew it was unfair. Like he, there, there's so much layering going on there, and so much of micro interacting with Frank at that moment. You know, trying to prove his own worth and his own value, and Frank, you know, knocking him out with one punch, but doing it in a very. I, I know this is hard to believe, but. I've been in situations where sometimes you have, like, I've never knocked somebody out like that, but sometimes somebody has a little bit too much to drink and you have to help calm them down in a fast fashion. And it's like Frank's way is to, is to punch somebody, you know, like it's, it it was just a very, you know, to, to get back to your point, very grounded scene. And, and I think really cool. And I love, um, I love the, the struggle that Frank has too in that, you know, especially with the Lieberman family, um, because Micros put him in a awful position, you know, um, in that he has to pretend like he doesn't know that he's alive. Um, and then he also has to pretend like everything's cool and, uh, you know, basically, yeah, we could totally be together if, if, um, you know, things go that way. Like he has to, he, He's put in this awful position to have to play this role, and and like I I, w- I was watching that scene and uh, specifically, and I was struck by how much that has to kind of hurt Frank because he kind of sees this woman start to feel a little bit something for him, and it's reminding him of of what he's missing, and it's got to kind of feel good to have somebody feel this way towards you, and yet he can't really have any of it or feel good about it. All he does is feel guilty about it. And it's not necess- it's not his fault. Micro's put him in this position, kind of to 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 have to be there. And it's just like, oh my gosh, the 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 psychology of what's happening with these characters is is really deep. And and what we get with Frank, I thought, was fascinating. I you know I I want to ask you specifically because of the scenario that we're talking about too, because I'm very conflicted about it about the fact that Micro spies on his family like twenty four seven. Ooh yeah, like. That's a really weird thing, you know, like there's a really, in a sense, how do you read that? I I, I have a couple of different reads I could take from it, but I'm always very conflicted about that. Um, You know, I I felt the same way, I think, in the sense that it seemed very weird and very odd. Um, But at the same time, I I tried to put myself just, you know, obviously I don't have a family like that. I don't have kids. I do have a wife, but I, I... the the wanting to make I guess make sure they're okay, um and and be watching out for them like that you know uh in the most uber I guess big father way um you know 
I get that, but it does almost seem like it almost does seem like this invasion of p- their privacy, especially since they f- they think he's dead, you know. And so, for all intents and purposes, f- for what they know, I mean, yeah, she could be dating by that point, um, you know, somebody right. else and, or whatever. And and like right. that that kind of violation, I, I you know, they. I don't remember them ever in the show, them realizing that he had been watching the whole time. And I don't know if he ever tells them he's been watching the whole time. I don't think they ever say it directly, but I think that I think there's a moment where they sort of piece it together because like they know something is wrong. You know, like they figure out something is wrong and they're like, well, how how the hell did you know? You know, that that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And see, the thing is, it's. I think it, it very much speaks to, uh, you know, a, a theme with Frank as well that, you know, I, I mean, we even see, but, you know, we, we love talking about Star Wars, as everybody knows, but like we see with Anakin, the desire to control and protect can lead you to some questionable choices. Yep, yep. And I think that Micro's, uh, you know, motivation is pure. He, you know, yeah, he wants to make sure his family is okay, but by doing it that way, all he's doing is setting himself up for pain and not moving on and not letting them move on. And they don't even know that they're not being let to move on. And, you know, like, and it's really, it's really it, like, and I, it, there, there's a part of me that even thinks, well, gosh, you made yourself disappear off the grid. Why didn't you like sneak in one night and be like, okay, everybody, we're going to go. I mean, obviously this is going to tip your hand that, you know, and then people are going to know that you're missing and that you took your family, and that you're not really dead, and they'll start looking for you again. But you've set up this little, you know, uh, shadow empire. Why can't you go off to like the hills of Montana and homeschool the kids? Or you know, like I, I get it. it. It's it's a conceit for the show, and it's you know more complicated than that and everything. But I don't know, man. It's just it's weird. It's really weird. It is. It is really weird. And, and again, I feel like um, I, it it made me feel really sad for frank especially as he kind of grows close to micro's daughter you know and she begins to care about him because she knows him as pete you know and and like begins to kind of see him as somebody um that's safe you know she can look to um you know and and all of that i felt like it just kind of got in fact one of the scenes that really got me uh in the show was when uh pete or frank shows up um and uh she and he had that little conversation he's like so i guess you're you're not really pete you know and like it just it just gets you there and the kind of in the feels for me like um because that's kind of who frank wanted to be was pete basically with his family and then it all got taken away from him and then he kind of has that opportunity again with you know, um, the Lieberman family, but then that's kind of taken away again. So it's just like he keeps having these losses of people. Um, and it's, it's, it's a hard thing to watch somebody go through that emotional, that much emotional stress, you know? Um, but I, I loved that he got that. And I loved that whole storyline with him because it felt like it, what it did with the Liebermans all together, you know, um, it brought out the humanity in Frank. And like you said, it helped you know that this character has more to him than the cold-blooded killer. He's not just a stone-cold killer. There's a heart beneath some of the stone he's kind of put around there, but you can still clear the rubble away and you'll find a person. And I just I think that's really yeah. interesting uh, to, to get to because... Um, I thought it was interesting because the, the, you know, the PTSD aspect, we see other characters who, well, I mean, it, I don't know if Frank really deals with it well at all, but we see characters who necessarily don't necessarily deal with it at all in a way that's healthy. And the biggest one was Lewis. Um, you know, he got, Frank has his friend Curtis who runs this um, therapy group for veterans and, and, and people, you know, with PTSD. And then you get uh, this character, Lewis, who's a kid. He's trying to get back into living as a civilian, and he can't. He can't make that switch 
but it, I, I felt like, and I, I wanted to ask you, did you feel like the show also showed that there was something else going on with Lewis, like that being at war had triggered something else in him? I think that, I, I think that what you can see with Lewis is Lewis has a reaction to being in the wartime situation that breaks, you know, it causes something that breaks inside of him. Whereas I think uh, they go to pains to show that war awoke something in Frank that wasn't, that was always there. And so maybe that is the difference is that Lewis never had that inside him. And as ugly as it is to say about Frank, he had that, that guy inside of him that could go into a building and slaughter a ton of people. Lewis wasn't that type of guy. They're both put in that same situation. Well, you put Frank in that situation, you, you're going to crack him and he's going to have problems and he's going to have his own way to deal with the PTSD. You throw Lewis in that situation and he's just going to break. He's just done. He was never meant to be there. That was never the place to put a guy like him. Not because there's anything wrong with him, but because that's just not who he was on any level. And I think that what's really interesting, because you mentioned, you know, the, the, the therapy group is I think one of the, the decisions that would have been so easy for Curtis to say, you know what, he might get himself killed, but he'll at least be happy if he goes back into a war zone because Lewis, you know, he found his niche again with Anvil and he was, he thought he knew what that was going to make him happy. And it's, um, I think the way they resolved it with Frank, that beautiful episode that was just amazing, showing the same event from different perspectives. When Lewis is on the other side in that meat locker and Frank is sitting there and Frank is saying, do it, do it, do it. There's a sense of Frank, Frank almost wanting to be on that other side. Like he, he related to Lewis in the sense that they both wanted it to end. They both wanted it over. The other thing that I thought was interesting, and and obviously it's, you know, meta textual. I think with Lewis, you know, a, a character who's um, kind of lost his sense of purpose, you know, being back, and of course uh, he he picks up on purpose from this, you know, kind of an alt right position, you know, and um, gets sucked down that hole. Um, literally digs a hole in his own backyard because he can't live inside. He, he's he gone to the therapy group, but he, he's not really ready or wanting to completely ask for help, you know, um, and he's not letting anybody help him. And, um, you know, more than talking about, I felt like, you know, the political positions of this character, Lewis, what I thought the show did a great job was showing the, the way in which we discount mental illness uh, and that so many people are watching him descend into madness, basically, and nobody really does anything to get him the help that he needs. You know, um, even his dad doesn't, you know, get the help that he needs in the sense of like, okay, Lewis needs something else. Like, he needs to be given the opportunity to be in a hospital to, to get better, you know? Like, that's what those kind of places are for. And as hard as that is to say about somebody that you love, I felt like this is one of those places where the show was really talking about and doing a great job about talking about you can pick whatever political position you want to give Lewis and he could be a crazy person, right? It doesn't matter. Um, right. He's yeah. still somebody who is in need of help because he can't overcome the mental state that he's in. And that's the point of us not really taking care of the people because we're either willingly disregarding it, people around them are disregarding it, or they're, they're not, or worse, they're just not even noticing it. And I, I really Whoa. liked that the show kind of gave us this look at this side to say, hey, we got to take care of these people in a better way, or this is the result. They people like this end up doing things like this, and we see that in the news. You know, 
way too frequently. Yeah, and I and I think that the the third option there is what we see at play, which is the person who knows the effect that their their endless uh, haranguing of the world with their point of view has on somebody like Lewis, but doesn't care because it validates them. And so I think that that gets into it's not it's not even manipulation so much as just you know it. It just makes that person feel right, uh, you know, because somebody agreed with them and they they got them to agree with them by by any means. But I think also in terms of dealing with the, uh, you know, the issue of mental illness with Lewis is his dad, I think, is out of his depth. And I think it's yeah, it's I, I think it shows how difficult it is to know the right thing to do, especially when his dad gives him you know, those pills and they're not, you know, he's just like, Hey, right. just take one. And it's like, you can't just, you know, you need a combination of things to help somebody. Right. You can't just make it go well, away magically. A doctor too. You should right. give yes, somebody medication. True. You're not going to have any idea what the effect might be on them. Um, yeah. And, you know, I, I think, you know, my wife uh, was in the military and she's in the national guard now and the importance of taking care of them, these people who serve us like this is so paramount. And, and the fact that it can take these guys so long and, and men and, and these men and women to get the, the support that they need because of the government bureaucracy is just not a good thing. Right. So I think that's another thing that we see here is just, there's gotta be a better way um, to take care of our veterans, you know, and, and, and to really be there for them. Because there are those, and we see that in that circle of these people who are struggling. Now, not everybody's struggling at it with the intensity that Lewis is, but they are all struggling. And we need to make sure that they have a place um, to go uh, and get the help that they need, whatever it is, and, and make it easier for them to be able to do so, so that they don't feel like a burden or that it's just too many hoops to jump through to get what they need. Yeah, and you know, and which I think gets to, you know, the nobility of of Curtis's character is that he recognizes that it's going to take personal action to do it. There's no abdication of, ah, somebody else will take care of it. You know, and and I think that I think that it's very uh interesting that they used it like there, I, if I recall correctly, um, you had sent me a note early on where you were basically like, I'm not sure where this Lewis thing is going. I thought that the way that they tied it together, the way that they brought it all together and had everything come to a head that way, I thought it was so it was so unexpected, but it felt so right. It's like when you watch, uh, you know, I always point to the ending of the show, The Shield, or or Breaking Bad, or something like that, where it didn't go the way that I thought it was going to go. But when it was done, I was like, "That's the only way it could have gone." And I I very much felt that this way because when they when the Lewis plot line came to a head is really when it gear shifts and it kicks things forward into the plot line you expect it to go into when you're watching, you know, a, a Punisher show. And I just thought that was really, really interesting, uh, the way that they did that. And the fact that they used, again, to speak to the tie-in thing, that they used Karen, who works at a newspaper, who we know from the Daredevil series. But if you don't know from the Daredevil series, they do a perfectly excellent job of introducing her to the flow of the story here and having her be the reason Frank suddenly starts to take a more, you know, vested interest in what's going on and, and those sorts of things with, with, with Lewis. And, uh, I thought that was a really deft way to, to bring in the outside Marvel mm -hmm. world without it being overbearing. Well, and, and I have to say, you know, I think it's a great time to, to talk about Karen that you bring her up. I love that she's in this show. Um, I love the actress. I think she's fantastic. She, I've really enjoyed her in the Daredevil series. I was a little frustrated in season two when she's just kind of like this pinging back and forth between Foggy and Daredevil and this weird love quadrangle going on with Electra and all. I, I, I get tired of that. But the fact that she was back here and back with Frank and the connection that they have. You know, I, I, I love that connection because there's something about 
him that fascinates her. Um, and I think there's something about him that's attractive to her. And there's something about him that also makes her protective of him. And there's all there's all these different facets going on in that relationship. And I think the same for Frank with Karen. You know, there's all these things that draw him to her. You know, he doesn't, ju- she doesn't just see him as a monster. You know, all of these things. Like, she wants to know the real Frank Castle. You know, not just the Punisher side. And I think that's something that... Um, helps bring that Frank out throughout the series here because she gives that to him. And and it shows that everybody has the ability to be more than just what people think they are or want to label them if somebody will believe in them and kind of show them the respect that they're due as a person because they're a person. And Karen does that for Frank, and I think it breaks it, it kind of I think it put it it puts a I don't know she begins to knock that armor off a little bit, you know, and uh, especially that he's built around his heart, you know uh the Kevlar around his heart comes peeling off, and it brings him back to life in a little uh, in some ways, and I love that she is that character, and not only that, she's just a really strong character. Um, you know, her arguments with the the congressman, you know, about gun control and the gun debate and stuff, I thought were one of the strongest points of the show because it was actually a real conversation about one of the biggest conversations that we're having in our country where two people weren't yelling and calling each other stupid or, you know, whatever. I just thought it was really well done. So Karen being in the show was a huge highlight for me. Uh, I, 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 obviously I completely agree. Um, I, I think that her relationship with Frank is incredibly, uh, incredibly affecting and incredibly interesting specifically because, I mean, if you, if you want to move out of, I mean, I agree with everything that, that you have said, uh, about their relationship, but then to bring it back to the tying it in thing is we know from Daredevil season two that Frank uh, is the complete opposite of a man who she's shown, you know, attraction with before and who's shown interest in her as well. And so I think there's a really interesting, an interesting opportunity to look through uh, Karen's relationship to both of them and say, what are the common threads that she's exposing about the two of them? What do we see thanks to her interaction that that makes, you know, maybe the Daredevil and the Punisher a little more similar. Now, of course, that has nothing to do with what's going on here, and that's just sort of like a tangent uh, that I go off on. Um, but, you know, because I couldn't really state what you said any better. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I actually really like that idea, though, because I, I do think that there is a similarity between Frank and uh, what we get with uh, Matt. You know, and I think part of it is that the way that they channel their anger it's the exact same thing, you know. Uh, they yeah, channel it by pummeling point. people, right? Uh, yeah. Daredevil doesn't kill them, but he will pummel them almost to death, you know. So they they are they are fueling their anger to try and make a difference, and the way that they do it is slightly different, but it it also has a lot of similarities too. So I think that yeah. that is kind of fascinating that Karen has this relationship with both of these guys and kind of has an attraction to both of them. Um, I do think what's interesting here is that uh, I also think Karen with Frank specifically has even more of the knight in shining armor feel. Um, I think she, she yeah. wants to be able to find a way to save Frank almost. And I think there's that part of it too. Yeah. Well, I, I think also daredevil has a little bit more of a, you know, he's tormented about what he does. He's like, I wish I didn't have to do this, but you know, he, he's the tormented hero. He doesn't, he wishes the world didn't make him do this sort of thing. Right. Whereas the worldview of Frank is, yep, well, it's gotta get done. Okay. You know, and it's like, I think that's an interesting debate to have is like, who's more honest with themselves? You know, like Matt is sitting there and he's like, no, I've got to be good. I've got to resist these urges. And Frank's like, well, nobody else is going to do it. So 
Uh, it's going to be me. Somebody's you know. got to do this ass. So. <laughs> you know? <it's> like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, definitely saltier <laughs> language in this show than in Daredevil. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, this, this was a show where I, I made sure the kids were fast asleep for a good long while uh, before I well, watched it. Yeah. Um, so I, Karen, I, I also brought up this idea of kind of the, the, you know, honest debate that they have. And I wanted to ask you about that because obviously if you look at our country and if you just turn on the news, it doesn't matter what news station, uh, this is probably going to come up, the Second Amendment gun debate. And um, I was just floored by the way that they presented both sides. And I thought for the most part, they did this really well. I agree. And I, it is sad to me that we consider it so spectacularly abnormal that we see two people on the opposite sides of an issue have a reasonable debate. They might get a little bit heated at, you know, at a point or two, but at no point do they do they simply dismiss the other's argument out of hand. They say, I hear what you're saying, but you can't really, th-, you know, like, but let me present this point to you. And you go back and forth and you talk about those sorts of things. I marvel at the fact that that does seem like such a rarity. I mean, how many times, how many of us talk about the fact that there's so much rancor in the world? Uh, Not rancors from Star Wars, that would be even worse. But there's so much going on back and forth where people are, it's an immediate, people are having arguments with the perception of the person's motivations who disagree with them. Whereas in this, it's two people having a disagreement and it's in the context of an episode where very specifically you see how everybody's uh, experience of something, and this speaks again to the PTSD thing. You put Lewis and Frank in the same situations Lewis is going, you know, it's going to break him because he was never meant to be there. It's going to awaken sort of a monster in Frank. And then you see this same sort of combat situation and you see the way the congressman reacts. You see the way Karen reacts. You see the way people make presumptions about everybody's motivation and goal. And you see how this one event that happens is experienced differently by everybody in it, depending on the point of view they have while it's happening. And I think that is really a fascinating thing. And, you know, I also applaud the fact that they, you know, because I, I, (laughs) until recently, I lived in the DC uh, metro area my entire life uh, until recently. And um, any jab they can take to, you know, expose a politician as a craven um, manipulator of opinion for their own personal gain. Yeah. Okay. You're going to get a little cheer out of me every time for that one. I agree with you. Um, And what I thought was really fascinating is the way that they dealt with Senator Ori in the sense of the way that he argued, because you know, Karen asked some very pointed questions. And what we came to find out is that this Senator never even been around guns. He's never shot a gun. he all he knows about guns is secondhand knowledge. And I thought that was really interesting because, you know, um, I know a lot of gun owners, you know, um, none of them are crazy or weird or, you know, whacked out. You know, they all have licenses to, to have those uh, firearms and, you know, all that stuff. Um, they've gone through training to use those things, you know, uh, they take care of it in their homes, you know, uh, you know, so, um, And I always find it interesting when people talk about a subject they don't have actual familiarity with the subject intimately. It, 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 you know, uh, it's like when somebody judges a book before they've read it and they're like, nah, I'm not going to read that. Now, if it's Fifty Shades of Grey, okay, I totally give that to you. You don't have to read that to know that it's... (laughs) Exceptions that proves the rule, huh? There are exceptions (laughs) to the rule, right? Um, But, I mean, I think we do this in in so many things in life and so many arguments we have in life. It's secondhand knowledge instead of specific knowledge or... Um, the knowledge of, of like actually sitting down with somebody on the opposite side and like talking through, okay, so how does this, you know, like really getting that understanding so that you can make the most informed decision. And, and 
I, I, what I loved about the debate is that, you know, it was interesting to me because Karen is arguing from a perspective of firsthand knowledge of one being a woman um, in a city full of crime and in an area of the city even more full of crime and how she herself feels comfortable. Um, and you have the senator, on the other hand, who's got armed security around him. You know, and, and so just the way they framed everything, I just thought was really well done, and it gave me a lot to think about on all sides of the issue. Um, and I, I just, the nuance of that and the fact that we could actually have the discussion, like you said, in the end, these two people aren't calling each other names. They're going point by point through their arguments and talking back and forth with each other, challenging each other, throwing some challenge flags like we might sometimes on the show. But it was a respectful debate, and, and I think, gosh, too bad... A TV show needs to show us the way to have a conversation again. Um, so, <laughs> but it was just, it was fantastically, you know, really well done. So I, I agree. And I think that something that can't be discounted is that they, you know, that both people intelligently argue their point of view and they both show something that I think is, is exceedingly rare. And I think this makes the conversation jump out it, the idea of compromise, saying, well, okay, so how do we, how do we come? together on this how do we figure this out and um and then of course everything you know goes straight to hell <laughs> you know and frank shows up to be frank and and, and stuff like that well and but, to save uh, them from lewis who has come yeah. there to kill them both you know and that whole situation playing out of and, and again like the yeah. way that they use that situation with karen you know to 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 show the heroism of Frank that he has, and again, the, the relationship that they have where she's willing to be, quote-unquote, the victim, you know, like being shown as like she's his hostage, but really she's playing along with him on purpose, you know, all those things. I just, it her being a part of the show was really, really well done, and, um, you know, Again, I would be okay if there's never another Punisher season, but there is, I would really like to see their relationship go somewhere like i would i would like to I see agree. more of them together because i feel like it's one of the best parts of this season watching that happen so i agree and and i think that there's also a very interesting uh counterpoint with madani who's uh you know the the strong female character who drives a lot of the plot the search for for the punisher and the way that she ties in to everything i think is extremely interesting and but I think that her plot line suffers because they felt, I mean, can we just go ahead and say how awkward it was that they felt the need to go as graphic as they did? I mean, it feels odd. It truly feels odd in a show with such ridiculously graphic, realistic looking violence to say, yeah, but the sex scenes went a little far. It feels weird saying those words, but at the same time, it felt so unnecessary to me to to do that. Did you get the same sort of reaction from that? I mean, I, in a sense, it felt almost like it took Madani's character down a peg and it was completely unnecessary. It it trivialized her in those moments, I thought. And that that was a damn shame because she's a great yeah. character. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree with you because, um, you know, I felt like the the scenes uh, themselves, if you had taken out the graphic nature of them, which wasn't needed because the point of that is that her and Billy Russo are, are connecting, you know, in, in a relationship and, uh, you know, they're going to have sex. I don't need to see them graphically have sex for 30 seconds to a whole minute on screen to get what's going on there because the beginning of the scene is is the most kind of important I think is they start to disrobe a little bit you know and like um she kind of sees his scars and I think you know there's a little bit of like there's something there for her a little bit of a turn on or whatever but you you don't have to then you know get super graphic with him and then the next episode there was another one and then i think uh, and in fact even if i remember it even opens with one um yeah and, then and, the, and the next see yeah. the next episode there's another one and it's like there i i didn't need that many of them for sure so if you're gonna do one just pick one and and do that but again i don't need the graphic nature of of the sex scene um, to know that somebody's having sex, you know, and I don't feel like it really adds anything. 
and, and that's what I'm saying. Like to me, I just don't. I I get it that it feels weird, but you know what? Let me put it this way: a sexual act between actors is always real. The violence is not. It's all fake. Nobody's really getting punched. Nobody's really bleeding. N- none of those wounds are real. All of that's fake, you know. But the actual, you know, interaction between those people is real, you know. Like they're kissing each other. They're holding each other. They're all those things are are, are much more real than the actual violence because it's mm. always fake. So well, to okay. Me, uh, just, so you know. So so what you're saying? You're not. You're not saying. Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's up to a point. Like, we're we're not going into the you right, know right. Stormy Daniels territory or anything <laughs> like that. But like, we're I I get what you're saying is what yeah. I'm saying is like with the violence, no matter how graphic it is, it's it's you know whoever's doing it, you're like, oh, how did they make it look like that? Oh, I know right. they didn't it's, really. It's do always that. a special effect. There's no whereas when two people are in an intimate scene, there's a certain amount of physical intimacy that's unavoidable, and so right. it's not. You know, it's like you're you're actually watching something yeah, that's kind of, yeah. yeah. I so, I, I, I get I, I get what I get you're that saying because with that. you know, as you were saying earlier, too, Madani is a really great character in this season, and I really enjoyed watching her piece all this together and her struggle to try and find the truth. Um, and and what I loved about her too is that she is somebody who does believe in the truth. You know, that there is an uh, a actual truth of what happened, you know, and even that episode that we talked a lot about uh, with, with Karen and Frank and Lewis and the senator, you know, that whole episode is about what the truth is between all of the different points of view. There is going to be a truth there, and we got to find it, and Madani is very much a believer that there was a truth happening there. And, and it's not just a truth it is the truth of what happened you know and that's what she's yeah. trying to find out about what happened in Afghanistan which leads her into this whole thing where she gets caught up with you know Frank and Billy and you know William Rollins and the rest I loved her character I thought she was really strong and I enjoyed watching her progress throughout the season and then of course the way that you know Micro and, and Frank and her start working together at the very end I thought that was really great but I am with you you know, having a strong, confident female woman have to disrobe and have a very graphic sex scene does seem to take away some of that um, gravitas that she had. Um, and you didn't need that because, you know, after the, the shooting where her partner dies and she's in the bathtub, you don't see any nudity there, right? Yes, but it's the intimacy exactly. of what's happening between her and the guy who just killed her partner. Like... That's the thing that freaks you out, you know, and so that's a that's a much better done scene than showing her and Billy earlier just getting it on. I I agree. I completely agree with you. Uh, But I do have to call out. I think that the Russo, the turn is just as enjoyable to watch happen as uh, John Hams was in Baby Driver, where you got this guy charming, 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 charming psychopath. And it's like, what happened? Oh, whoa, what happened? And he he pulled it off. I mean, the performances in this entire series, I don't I can't think of a single bad performance from anyone. And it, I think that is I think the writing, I think the performances just elevated it. And John Bernthal, I've been a fan of this guy for a while. And I'm so thrilled, but as great as he is, like these other performances, you know, rising tide lifts all boats. I just, I thought all of them were just great. Just great. <laughs> quick, quick side note, but I remember watching The Accountant and John Barenthal's <sighs> in there uh, with, with, um, uh, Ben Affleck and they have they have a fight scene together and it's like hey the Punisher and Batman are fighting each other this is so cool <laughs> considering one is a derivative of the other yes. that is so meta that it, was, it makes it my was brain really hurt. funny um, yeah. if you haven't seen that movie I really enjoyed it by the way uh, you know uh, listeners so uh, check that out I, I thought it was a pretty cool movie but uh, Billy Russo um, I wanted to ask you okay so the the mountaintop scene where they go to his friend, um, where Micro and him go to his friend's place in Kentucky, and the soldiers come. My first thought was, oh, those are Anvil soldiers. 
those are not CIA guys. And then I knew yeah. Billy was bad. Did you know that too? Did that click with you there? Uh, it was one of those things where I, the best way I can say it is I suspected but wasn't sure. And then when they revealed it, it was like, ah, yeah, okay, okay. Um, but even that, you know, even that was, that had shades of uh, that whole sequence where they came at them in the mountaintop had shades of uh, First Blood, the original Rambo movie. Oh, of, yeah, yeah. I can you know, the, the guy in the wilderness yep. and the, the quote unquote good guys, the law are the bad guys mm-hmm. and he's got a, he's got a fight to, to survive and everything like that. It's, that was, in, that was an interesting, I don't know if that was an intentional homage or if it's just anything that's in that sort of situation is going to make me think of it sort of thing. Um, it, it's funny because when they do the reveal of Russo, you think back through the entire season and you're like, yeah, okay. They, they did a really good job of dropping clues so that if you go back and you rewatch it, you can be like, ah, there's a tell. Ah, there's a tell. They did, like, it's not one of those um, O. Henry things that is like Cylons at the end of uh, season three of Battlestar Galactica. So. Yeah, no, I, I, the, the character was so well done. And what I liked was the way, again, they kind of played with the the reason that everybody did everything like they the motivations behind the characters and you know they they mentioned it a couple of times that for billy the the motivation were, for him in life was to get laid to have money and to have respect like to get those things he didn't have growing up and he was going to make that happen no matter what he had to do. In fact, he, he didn't really have a conscience about it that much. Um, he, he, had, he had willfully destroyed his conscience so that he could do the things he needed to do to get what he wanted. And I thought that that was really interesting because, again, I think there's an Anakin parallel there of Anakin destroying his own conscience to get what he wants. I mean, the moment Anakin kills younglings, um, you know, conscience is gone. Uh, you know, I, I think Billy is the same character. I mean, when he kills Madani's partner and then he's in her bedroom with her uh, and in her bathroom and he's washing the blood of her partner off of her. I mean, it is just sick. Like, you're like, this dude is gross. I, I mean, and to know that he's touching her and what he's just done, it just, it's one of the creepiest things in the show. And it's not violent at all. It's just what you know about these two people and what's just happened. And he plays it so well. I mean, like you said, there isn't a false note here with any of the actors that they've chosen. And, and Billy was was right on target. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree. I mean, and it's such a joy to discover a show like this that I, I'm, I'm still at a loss. I don't understand why this hasn't on my radar shown up more why there hasn't been more discussion about the show um and i i i can honestly say this is the most i've enjoyed a marvel uh tv show in i mean in years Uh, and it's i i think everybody involved in this deserves major kudos uh for what they pulled off because it would have been so terribly easy to simply have this be an eight episode Punisher killing everybody, which would have been more of a Garth Ennis type of thing because uh, that, that would have been that Punisher who was just a remorseless killing machine. And it was used as sort of like this meta commentary on, you know, uh, nihilism and and modern life and, and stuff like that. And it would have been so easy for them just to give that because that's what people were expecting. And the most joyous discoveries of shows or movies or any property is one that decides they're not going to give you what you're expecting. They're going to subvert it and they're going to keep you with it and they're going to make you enjoy it the whole time. And I think they pulled it off completely with this. Yeah, I, I did. I, I, I really felt like that, too. And um, I, I think that the 
the way in which they were able to keep you engaged without having to have him on a murderous rampage every five seconds. And the way the, the show does have this kind of deliberateness to it. And it takes its time with the story it's telling, but that's so it can bring all the pieces together. And one of the faults, and I think maybe the reason this isn't as much on people's radar, John, I like you bringing that up, but I think a lot of people got turned off by Iron Fist. I thought a lot of people didn't really enjoy the Defenders because it wasn't as strong as it could have been. Um, And so you do a couple of shows like that and people just kind of stop paying attention to when these come out. And it's disappointing because this one, again, I, I'm with you. I think this is the strongest since, you know, Daredevil season one, for sure. I mean, this uh, this sits right up there and it's battling that out for, for top place. Um, and I think part of that is just because it created these compelling villains in the show that really challenged our heroes, but they also they were characters that you believed from the real real world, right? You, like a William Rollins character. Like you believe this guy exists out there. You know, it, it's kind of yeah. like, um, I know you haven't seen it, but when I watched House of Cards the first season, I kind of thought to myself, there's way too much truth in this show. It's probably not exactly like this, but I get the feeling like it's more like this than we know. Right. Uh, I I did see season one of House of Cards, okay. and uh, so. there are there are some true notes to it. Yeah, yeah. and and I agree with you. I, there are people like Rollins out there. There's no question. Um, there are people in the system, you know, and and in society that you know move about us, and their masks are invisible, but boy, they they wear them well. So, and he was great too in the show. I mean, he the. The way in which Rollins is completely amoral was perfect. Like, that's what you want from your villain. The guy who can justify whatever he's doing because his only moral is his, himself. And he talks of these platitudes about, you know, the United States and, you know, freedom and rah, rah, rah. But it's all just a cover for him getting to be where he wants to be and getting to do what he wants to do, you know? And, and uh, yeah. it's, um, the, I think that's the scary thing because, um, and I liked how a lot of the different characters were mirrors for each other. But I liked the mirror that Madani and Rollins were for each other because, you know, she's somebody who, she's resigned to being where she is. She knows the life that it's going to be. But she's not willing to trade any single part of her dignity or um, belief that freedom is the best and we have to protect it. And the best way to do that is to follow the rules. She's a believer in the system. If we follow that system, it's a good system. And Rollins is on the other side of using the system, gaming the system to get whatever he wants. And I liked the way, again, they just kind of show the the different ways of approaching you know quote unquote public service and madani is the kind of person you want and rollins is the kind of person you loathe and fear is actually in charge <laughs> yeah i i agree with all of that absolutely <laughs> oh man um well i did i one person that we didn't really actually talk specifically about i think we should probably uh talk about was i you know, David Lieberman and Micro and just the portrayal of him. And then uh, I, I really liked the way he wasn't like a guy that you liked all the time. Because to me, like he wasn't somebody that I liked all the time, but uh, I also found him completely understandable. And in the end, I had major sympathy for him. But they always kind of, I like, I felt like for me, they kind of kept him on the edge of being like, do I like him? Do I not like him? What do I think about him? You know, like, um, and it's because they put him in book against Frank, who is somebody that we already do care about, you know? And the way that they made me kind of feel for David in the end, I loved it. Like, I, I, I've, I liked the way they pulled that off. I thought that they did it great. Uh, yeah, I, th- I thought that, um, I, I think his name is 
uh, even Moss Brock. I think that's his, his yeah, name. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I don't think the show works without him. I honestly don't. He's, um, I thought that uh, the the subtleties that he brought to the performance and the believability that he brought to Micro uh, and the chem- the real, very real chemistry that he seemed to have with, uh, with John Bernthal, I think make the entire show work. Um, casting Micro, I think, was probably the most important of all of the side characters. And uh, if it went wrong, if you didn't get somebody who did it just pitch perfect right, it, the whole show was going to suffer. And I think they, I think they cast the right guy, and I think that he just absolutely nailed it. I think, I think that everything about Micro, I think the greatest thing about the character is, regardless of the likes or dislikes about what he does or what he says or anything like that, is he is very human, and I yes, believe that yes. Micro exists, and that is in no small part, not just of the writing but the performance. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. No. I mean, and. Not only that, but I, I felt like he had a good chemistry with the people that were his family when they finally came back together. Really liked that. Um, and just to mention, a sex scene that does work is the one between him and his wife, which isn't super graphic. Yes. Like, there's a, a realism to them finally finding that time t- to reconnect right. after that. You know, like, there was something there. And then, like, the last scene between him and Frank where Frank's like, I, I can't, I can't go in. You know, um, it breaks your heart that Frank won't let himself have that, that he could have yeah. a family um, that he they're offering him the ability to have a life to start a, a new life and that he's rejecting it. And it kind of hurt to watch him just throw that away when that family loves him now. Uh, but the thing is, I think it very much works because of the fact that the at the end, he winds up in that group. And yes, yes, Frank needs yes. to fix himself before Absolutely. he can re- rejoin a group. And I think mm-hmm. that that, yeah, as I was watching the scene unfold, I was saying, ah, come on, go in, go in, go in. But then when it wrapped up, the way it wrapped up, I said, yeah, he's got to fix him yeah. first. I, I, yeah, I think you're right on. I, I think um, the fact that he didn't just kind of like leave town for good, the fact that he became part of that group was really fantastic. So um, I feel like I could talk about this show a lot more, John, because it is really just something that I, uh, and even just talking it through with you, I'm actually excited. My My wife did not get a chance to watch it with me. She was away on a trip and I had to watch it. Uh, and so... I'm excited to get to watch it again, but this time with her. Uh, so what would you rate this one? As tempted as I am to take some sort of like you know stand of like, oh well, those those sex scenes were crossing the line. I I, I mean, I got to give it a perfect score, right? whatever scale you want to give it. I think they hit it out of the park with this. Um, and any missteps that occur along the way, they earn those missteps. You know, like. Anything that we're, you know, in the final fight where you're like, oh, come on, you're really pushing it. How far I'm going to believe that somebody can, you know, withstand and everything like that. They earn it. And I think that they earn every last bit of forgiveness for the occasional oopsie. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I think it's a perfect show. I, I I give this the highest marks and highly recommend it across the board. Well, that's going to be two highly recommends because I don't I don't know what number I'd put on this. And, you know, I, I feel... As I said earlier, this is one that just battles with the original Daredevil season uh, right there at the top. And in fact, I don't really think it matters which one is better. I think they're just fantastic shows. And and the way that they use the entire season to tell a very cohesive, well-thought-out, structured story was wonderful. And, and as I said before, if I never see this character again, I almost feel like they'd be doing us a favor by not trying to one up this season because I don't know how you do that. Um, and so, I, you know, if we, again, if we never see him again, I feel like his story has been well told and we can just imagine whatever, you know, Frank's doing now. And so uh, it's, it really is. It's a fantastic season of television here on Netflix. And, and man, I, I hope that, 
you know, as they continue to make, and I know they have Jessica Jones coming out soon. I hope that season is great. Um, I hope that they can kind of continue on this trend because the thing that I feel like the season did the best, it knew its focus. And it stayed on that even when you thought like, where is this going? It does. It all comes together in the end. Uh, And I didn't feel like these major fluctuations for throughout the season where it was like, oh, you're really high one moment. And then you get a couple episodes where you're like, what the heck? Yeah. No, I, I, I agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. I just didn't get that. So great season. So glad that, you know, we got a chance to sit down and talk about it. This was so much fun. And I really hope that other people will find the show and check it out. Make sure, again, you check us out all over the place. Uh, give us uh, the review on iTunes. Um, want to thank uh, the associate producers we have th- here through Patreon, Ken Tripp and Davis Grayson. Great guys, and they have been supporting this show and the network through Patreon for so many years. We really appreciate that support because without them, everything we do here in the network, 602 Club included, can't come to you. It's just too big for us to handle by ourselves. So go over to patreon.com slash trekfm and see how you can become part of the team. We've got some great perks. We love giving back to you in different ways. Um, But again, every little bit helps. So if you enjoy what you hear on Trek FM, make sure you let us know by just giving a little bit a month to make sure it keeps coming to you. Um, John, it's always great to have you back. You know, this is the first place we met was the 602 Club. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we've your, your seat, it, uh, hopefully it's it stayed comfy for you. But uh, where can everybody find you if they're wanting to talk to you maybe a little bit more about the Punisher or see what else you're up to? Uh, well, I lurk online uh, in the Babel Conference uh, from time to time. Uh, and you can also find me as Kessel Junkie. That's my online nom de plume. And you can find me uh, co-hosting right here on Trek FM, Stage 9 with Mike Schindler. And if you go out there into the great ether that is the internet, you'll also find me co-hosting Words with Nerds with my pal Craig. And if you go over to the Nerd Party, uh, once again with Mike Schindler, I'm co-hosting Great Shot Kid. And then you can find me on a, a little show called Aggressive Negotiations with, uh, with my charming co-host Matthew Rushing. Matt... What can you tell people about Matthew rushing on aggressive negotiations? Well, uh, he uh, really likes Star Wars. Big fan of uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Um, he's proud to be on the show with you where we won a Parsec Award. Um, actually blown away by the fact that that happened. Yes. And honestly, um, it is one of the things that I look most forward to each and every week is recording with you. So, I mean, that that's just a little bit oh, about me making on me blush. aggressive negotiations. So. Right back at you, man. <laughs> um, you could find me on uh, Twitter, MattRushing02. I'm also on Instagram under the same name. Here on the network, doing The Orb with Chris Jones, talking about Star Trek Deep Space Nine. And then on the Nerd Party Network, of course, I'm doing Aggressive Negotiation with John and Owl Post with Drea Coffin, where we're talking about every single chapter of Harry Potter, one chapter at a time. So check that out. And then last but not least, talking about film through the lens of faith, looking at the morals, meanings, and messages of the films. Uh, with my friend Courtney over on Cinema Stories. And you can check all of those shows out that both John and I do wherever you get your podcasts. But thank you so much for joining us. And y'all come back now to hear. Here.